We bought this $30 power supply, a top seller on Amazon, to see how it does when we throw it against our lab load tester back here. This is only a 430 watt power supply, but today that's enough to power most low end and mid range computers. It will not power a computer with one of these. In fact, 430 watts is not even enough only for this, ignoring the rest of the computer, but it shouldn't be rolled out just on the capacity alone. And today we're gonna take it apart to see how it looks internally and test for efficiency, voltage ripple, and everything else. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. Our recent budget power supply roundup produced a lot of charts like these, but these power supplies are all in the 50 to $80 price range. And what they were missing was a true dirt cheap power power supply. We, uh, we took it apart before this. It didn't ship like that. So today we're going to be reviewing this one. Now, uh, we wanted to go low end, but we didn't want to go as low end as Diablo Tech or Gigabyte's GP750M. Oh, so short of those Diablo Tech power supplies or the Tiger Direct ones, this was the cheapest one that's actually 80 plus and actually still made and something that people are buying today. So this is the Thermaltake 430 Watt Smart. That's its common name. Thermaltake labels its lowest end bottom of the barrel power supplies as its smart series, which we assume is because in modern society, intelligence is not valued. So uh, this is the one we were looking at. We have taken it apart already. We ran it through our load tester again back here for a series of tests to make sure it wouldn't explode. And we've done a full look at the efficiency, the voltage ripple, everything else you need to know about it. See if it's actually worth it because what we really want to look at here is not just the 50 to $80 range where, you know, they're probably pretty good power supplies. We really wanted to see how far can you step down the power supply? Because you always hear people say in comments and videos, including ours, don't cheap out on a power supply. But how cheap is cheaping out on the power supply is what we're going to try and answer today. For the rating, it's just an 80 plus white label, which is the lowest of the 80 plus efficiency certificates that they can get. There's all kinds of problems with 80 plus certifications. We talked about those in the past and their shortcomings in a separate video that we'll link in the description below if you're curious. But that's what it ships as. And in terms of cabling, it's just your standard 24 pin. It'd be awfully inconvenient if they didn't include that. And then uh, two PCIe cables, that's it. So you just get these two that are pigtailed together or daisy chained and uh, no additional PCIe connections. And then one eight pin for the CPU along with your standard sort of SATA and Molex, things like that. Floppy drive connector as well. Overall then, this sets you up to run a pretty basic video card no more than two eight pins, of course, but you probably shouldn't really be close to that anyway. So the fan, you can see it's labeled Thermaltake. They call it the EFS 12E12M. It's a 120 mil fan, which you can see uh, measured against our mod mat. You can buy one of these on store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to get one for PC disassembly and things like that. And if we pull the label, it is a very simple and cheap rifle bearing core in here, which we've confirmed by destructively testing it. It's packed with lubricant, but otherwise there's nothing really of note uh, other than the, the reservoir. And the actual manufacturer for this fan is Hua Xinrong, and they uh, market it as a, it's a 12 volt 0.25 amp fan. Not very powerful, but it's, I mean, it's a $30 power supply. So you're looking at probably a cost of about a dollar for this type of fan, maybe a little bit more, but it's basically the same thing you'd find in a cheap case. We have the platform over here that Patrick Stone's gonna walk you through in a bit to talk about the quality of the power supply. And for the rest, it's really just the case and not much else. So when we were hooking this up for testing on our power supply load equipment, our main goal was to verify that the protections actually work because the protections for your components, very important. And those are basically used for things like over power protection, over current protection, uh, short circuit protection, things that matter a lot. 
if you don't want your power supply to kill other parts in the system. So that was our first goal because it's cheap. And those are typically the things that either aren't present or don't work when they're cheap. And they're also the things that turn a $30 purchase into a $500 purchase if it starts to kill other things in the system. Uh, our next goal was to verify the 80 plus white certification here and make sure that it actually meets or exceeds the 80 plus uh, basically below bronze spec. So that's not too hard to hit comparatively. So that was goal number two. And hopefully with that information, we can help to paint a picture of whether it's actually worth 30 bucks just to get a computer up and running. Now, one thing we noticed that you lose right away with a budget power supply is apparently accurate documentation from the manufacturer itself, or at least from Thermaltake. The information on the website, the online manual, and the physical item, like the box and the paper manual, are all conflicting. So we decided that the physical products superseded the online information, and we mostly used that information for our testing. Input for this power supply works in most regions. It states that it supports anything from 100 to 240 volts AC at anywhere from 47 to 63 hertz. The physical labeling suggests that it can handle up to 10 amps on the input, but in this particular case, we would encourage viewers to look at the website for more accurate information because the GBU-806 AC DC rectifier inside this unit is only rated for 8 amps, so the 10 amp number doesn't really make sense. Now, before even plugging this in, one of the things we immediately noticed that we didn't like was a very basic piece of information on the label. You can see that 12 volts, we can only get a maximum of 387 watts despite being a 430 watt power supply. And we really don't like it when companies do this. Uh, our viewpoint here when we're reviewing parts and people may have different opinions, but our approach is that the 12 volt rails should be able to do the total capacity of the power supply because otherwise it's basically sort of cheating the spec or line because uh, although it's declared, people don't look at that 387 watt number. They look at 430. Almost all of the power on your computer is 12 volts. So the fact that it can do 110 watts combined on 3.3 and 5, but only 387 on 12 volts, that, that doesn't make up for the difference we're seeing. So that obviously annoys Patrick Stone and I when we're reviewing these things. The uh, 5 volt standby rail can do 12.5 watts, and then the uh, negative 12 volts doesn't really matter. It can do 3.6. So those are fairly standard for that but it is lacking the ability to actually go up to 430 on 12, which when you're calculating your combined CPU plus GPU power under a full system load, you should be doing so against 387, not against 430. So that's an important point that people overlook. For this, we need to do more of a teardown and some in-depth detail on which parts are good and bad in here, what might cause you a problem in the future if you actually use this thing. And for that, we're gonna go to Patrick Stone. He's going to be doing some uh, switched mode power supply basics. Because this is a cheap low end power supply, it actually serves as a great candidate for teaching about some of the basics of how power supplies work and what you need to look for when buying one. So even if you're not buying this, you get some value. So we're gonna go to him for the teardown and then we're gonna come back and go through the numbers and the benchmarks. We're gonna do something a little different today. We're gonna throw in a block diagram, something you guys have requested in the comments section. We're gonna hopefully take you from the input side of the power supply all the way to the output side and teach you about the individual stages and hopefully be able to relate those stages to the individual components that carry out those stages. In the TT Smart 430, there are uh, X caps and Y caps on the back side of the power connector. This is an X cap inside this heat shrink wrap and these little blue guys are Y caps. Uh, but then as we go on to the main PCB where it would plug in from here, which is these two contact points right here. We also have uh, another X cap, that's this little yellow block. And to be honest, this little yellow block is pretty much the same thing you're finding over here in this heat shrink wrap. Uh, then there's also two more Y caps, this little blue guy and this little blue guy. So in total, you've got four Y caps, two X caps, and two common mode chokes. The common mode chokes are this guy and this guy. And those pretty much complete the, trans the EMI filter. Now, the transient part of the filter, uh, keeping the power transients from destroying parts inside the power supply, starts right here. We've got a regular fuse. Uh, in this case, it's a 240 volt fuse. And then an MOV or a metal oxide varistor. That guy's job is to limit uh, voltage spikes. And then as we go around the power supply into the APFC section, there's another piece that helps handle inrush current. That's this right here. This is an NTC thermistor. Um, now, the NTC thermistor usually is accompanied by a bypass relay. 
Uh, but that's not the case on this power supply because it's a lower cost power supply. The bypass relay is strictly there for efficiency improvements and so on a low cost power supply they're going to go ahead and get rid of that component. The next two blocks in the diagram are involved with APFC. The rectifier handles the initial AC to DC conversion, that's this little guy right here, and the TT430, it's an 8 amp GBU806. Uh, if you're looking for that stamp on the component, it's usually down here at the bottom. Uh, the, this particular 806 just means that it can handle 8 amps and 600 volts. There are often two of these in, that handle higher current and higher output PSUs. There's only need for one with this conservative 431 watt output on the thermal take. The second block of the diagram shows an inductor, that's this guy right here, and a capacitor, this guy right here, which we've removed for safety. Uh, the two components work with the other APFC electronics to get the power factor as close to one as possible before it moves on to the high frequency switching. This part of the circuit also boosts the voltage and provides some filtering. Go back to the bulk capacitor. This particular one is from TIPO. It's an LG series capacitor. It's a 105C rating, and if you look at the data sheet, it's also 2,000 hours at 105C. Uh, it's 420 volt um, and 270 microfarad. The 270 microfarad is underwhelming. It's uh, not very impressive. Uh, but again, this is a budget power supply, so that's kind of what you're going to get. The 105C is good. Uh, there are lower rated temperatures on capacitors, like 85C is common. Um, and the 2,000 hours at 105C is also on the low end of things. You can get uh, 10,000 and 12,000 hour rated capacitors there as well. Basically, what we're getting at here is that because it's a budget power supply, you're getting a budget capacitor. Capacitors with more capacitance uh, and longer lifetime in terms of hours are what you're going to find in a more expensive power supply. The next block is necessary to reduce the size of the main transformer. Transformers have a nifty EMF equation that helps to explain the relationship between size and frequency. Oversimplifying things, we can say that the higher the frequency, the smaller the transformer can be. And what we're talking about is this versus that. So this thing weighs probably as much as this power supply with the cables included, if not more. And we don't want to have to pack these in power supplies. So that EMF equation, again, overly simplified version of it, basically says that if we increase the input signal frequency, then we can reduce the size of this transformer. The next stage is more rectification. The high frequency, low voltage signal has to be converted from an AC square wave, that's like, you know, the little line like that kind of thing, into as close to a DC signal as possible. The rectification can be done in a bunch of different ways, but in this low-cost TT power supply, they opted to go with two MHCHXM SBRs. Yeah, that, that's the name of the company. Another set of inductors and capacitors make up the final block, labeled filter, on the block diagram before output to your PC parts through these cables like this. Uh, the stage also handles the output voltage regulation. In the Smart 430, the type of regulation is called group regulation, and it's easily identifiable by the fact that there are only two inductors. The larger coil regulates the 12 volt and 5 volt output, while the smaller coil is for 3.3 volt. The group regulation is one of the cheapest ways to do regulation, but it's usually avoided due to uh, the cross-loading problem that it creates. And we'll touch on 12 volt, 5 volt cross-load as we get to the testing data. Uh, inside the Smart 430 watt TIPO SC series caps are added to each output to help smooth or filter the signal. For the 12 volt signal, we've got these two caps right here. Uh, for the 5 volt and the 3.3 volt, we've actually got the same set of caps. It's a pair here for the 5 volt and a pair here for the 3.3 volt. And then the negative 12 is, is this cap right here, and then the 5 VSB uses this cap right here. All these caps are standard electrolytics. You won't find any solid polymer caps on this unit as they're usually more expensive. The passive rectification right here uh, in, in the SBRs, the group regulation, that's these two, and these two inductors, and the complete lack of solid polymer caps uh, are a set of first in any of our Gamers Nexus power supply reviews. Up until this point, we've seen mostly synchronous rectification. Uh, so different circuit board right here with uh, MOSFETs and independent regulation, so more inductors, and a mix of caps, meaning electrolytics and solid polymers, so when we, while we've been reviewing more expensive power supplies. The presence of these design choices hints at a lower cost PSU. Uh, the reduced price point comes at the cost of reduced output signal quality. There's a transformer that's just for the 5 VSB right here, a little choke which is just for the 5 VSB, and a microcontroller, or just, just call it a controller. Uh, in this case, it's an Excellence. Uh, EM8564A. Uh, this protections I see is the thing that handles things like short circuit protection and overpower protection. Our goal today was to take a block diagram and relate it to the internal components. If you can take a look at internal components in a power supply and tell the difference between the internal components in an inexpensive power supply versus the ones in an expensive power supply, then you can probably determine if the value is there. And that's ultimately, ultimately what we're shooting for at GN. And now, 
Back to you, Steve. We'll start our task with Volta Dripple. We were hoping for big, exciting changes in the new ATX v3.0 multi-rail desktop platform power supply design guide. And the Volta Dripple specs are still exactly the same. The maximum spec of 120 millivolts peak to peak on the 12 volt rail or 50 millivolts peak to peak on 5 volt, 5 volt standby and 3.3 volts are still very lax for what we think is actually good. So we'll continue to build comparisons to other power supplies as that provides more useful information than just simply testing against a spec that isn't really that good to begin with. Being an extremely cheap but still 80 plus power supply, we expected the thermal take 430 watt power supply to perform worse than everything else. And it did. It definitely didn't let us down in the voltage ripple measurements if we were looking for poor performance. It excelled in performing poorly. When compared to the $50 to $80 power supplies that we tested at 100% load, it had almost double the peak to peak voltage ripple on the 12 volt rail. At 91.7 millivolts, this is one of the worst performing power supplies we've seen in terms of ripple. Keep in mind that we recommend a maximum of 80 millivolts ripple and we suggest that 60 millivolts is desirable for higher end parts or especially as you get into overclocking and this affects the stability of the system overall. It's possible that some component combinations could experience instability from this level of ripple from the thermal take 430 watt smart, but for most realistic combinations, it's okay. We'll forego going through all of the details on the ripple comparisons as the thermal take smart power supply at 430 watts was the worst every time, but we'll at least share the data for just this device without all the others on the chart. It didn't fare much better on other voltage rails, so at 100% load, the best result was on the 3.3 volt rail, which had 66.4 millivolts peak to peak ripple. Five volt standby came in at 71.2, and the five volt rail was 77.6 millivolts. Those numbers are so poor that they don't even make the official ATX guidance cutoff. That lands thermal take worse than all the others we've tested this past year, and also even in some cases below the very loose spec. Up next is power efficiency. The thermal take smart 430 watt is listed as 80 plus base certified, which means that it has 80% efficiency at 20%, 50%, and 100% loads. Our testing verified certification on those loads. The power supply reached its peak efficiency at 40% load when it registered 84.2% efficiency. And we're seeing a trend in the budget power supplies where 40% load seems to be the level for that peak efficiency. It'll be interesting to see if that holds true for more powerful units later. But compared to the other budget power supplies, the less expensive thermal take smart 430 watt has lower efficiency than all the other competitors. The EVJ 700 BQ, currently $60 and rated bronze, outperforms the thermal take 430 watt in every metric. It has significantly better 2% performance, although this doesn't really matter that much considering losses on 2% load are minimal since it's such a low load. And then if we look elsewhere, it has 83.6% and 88.6% efficiency results for the higher loads. We'll describe the thermal take power supply as scraping by in most of these. For 12 volt regulation across loads, the inexpensive smart 430 watt did very well tying the Seasonic Focus GM650 for the best results. This is only one test though. Let's look at five volt standby, 3.3 volts and five volts for regulation. These all show at least 3% variation. Ideally, we would like to see something less than or equal to 2% variation, but to reality check things, we're talking about a $30 power supply here. So it's fine for its intended use, just don't exit that use. During the component analysis and teardown, we talked briefly about group regulation and how it could have an impact on cross load testing results. These next two charts show exactly what we were talking about. When heavily loading the 3.3 and 5 volt rails and leaving the 12 volt rail with very little load, we can see that the 12 volt and 5 volt rails have a higher than desired, meaning greater than 2% voltage variation. At the same time, the 3.3 volt rail sees almost no impact. This relates directly back to the group regulation design where the 12 volt and 5 volt rails share the same inductor and where the 3.3 volt rail has a smaller but independent inductor. The results are similar when the load is skewed heavily toward the 12 volt rail. Once again, we see an obvious impact on the 12 volt and 5 volt rails of variations but the 3.3 volt rail is unaffected. Comparative power factor results are similar to the efficiency ones. The thermal take unit sits at the bottom of the chart at 2%, 40%, and 100% loads. Even at 100% load, where most power supplies exceed 0.99 power factor, the smart 430 watt couldn't quite get there. It only registered a 0.989. 
The power factor results aren't what we'd call noticeably bad at this price class, but they are objectively the worst of the bunch. For protections, the product page and packaging only claim OVP, OPP, and SCP, or over voltage protection, over power protection, and short circuit protection. We still put it through our regular test suite to see what would happen, and the results were scattered. Looking at short circuit protection, this is one of the protections that was supposed to be in place, and for the most part, it was, just not in a complete and actually well-executed sense. In the first test pass, it was evident that the 12 volt, 5 volt, 3.3 volt, and 5 VSB rails each had a short circuit protection. The rarely used negative 12 volt registered as a failure. So to make sure it wasn't a mistake, we ran through a second pass and then we confirmed the failure. Then it occurred to us that this is an inexpensive power supply, so maybe that just removed the minus 12 volt signal altogether to save on cost. So we checked for the presence of a blue wire on the ATX24 pin connector and it was there. The 24 pin wire, if you look at our mod mat for example, is the minus 12 volt rail. That didn't necessarily indicate that there was power running across it, so we next had to make sure that it was present by checking on an oscilloscope. After verifying that the signal was there, we ran the short circuit test two more times. Minus 12 volts failed short circuit protection on four straight passes. At this point, we began to doubt our own test equipment, so we manually shorted the minus 12 volts to ground, hoping for a shutdown. Instead, we burned a diode on the bottom of the PCB. So. Of course, this destructive test was done after all the other power supply testing was complete, and we believe that it's safe to say this power supply does not have short circuit protection on the, again, rarely ever used minus 12 volt rail. OCP was not claimed on the packaging or advertising for the product, but as we stated, we test for overcurrent protection anyway. Since the manual stated that over power protection would trigger somewhere between 100 and 170% for the power, we guessed that the same would be true for OCP if it's present. So we moved the high end of our testing range for the main rails from 150% to 170% of the maximum rated current. The 3.3 volt rail shut down the power supply at anything over 18 amps. The 5 volt rail took 26.2 amps or 46% higher than its max rated 18 amps before shut down. 5 volt standby followed the trend we've been seeing of reaching almost 200% of the maximum current rating. And on the thermal take power supply, it hit 192% or 4.8 amps before shutting down. The 12 volt rail triggered a shutdown at just over 53 amps, but it's possible that this was due to OPP as the value exceeds the overpower protection limits that you'll see in just a moment. Our conclusion here for OCP was that it looks like there's some overcurrent protection and this tracks with the capabilities of the Grenergy GR8329N protections I see that's in there. It's possible that Thermal Take chose not to list it in the specs because OCP implementation was somehow incomplete or because of that 12 volt trigger point being so high. Finally, overpower protection fell in the middle of the advertised 110 to 170% range at 131.9%. As with the other protections tests, we ran at four passes to verify the results, and each time OPP triggered shutdowns at about the same point. Last up is the packaging of the power supply, the construction quality of the cables, looking at the wire gauge, things like that, and just overall how it's put together by Thermaltake. So opening up the Thermaltake box, they don't give you much. There's some bubble wrap that protects the power supply and shipping, so fair enough. There's a paper manual, which again, conflicts with the information in the online manuals. There's a warranty card, and then there's a power supply cable that goes to the wall. So just a standard power cable where this one is an 18 gauge option, and a few zip ties, four screws for your computer case, and of course, a giant twist tie that was around the cables. And that's it for the box. So packaging is really straightforward. We actually like this, especially on a cheaper product. It doesn't make sense to waste uh, any significant portion of the cost of the power supply as a product on the packaging when it's already $30. They need to spend it on the actual product at that point. So we're okay with everything that's in the box and around it. As for the cables, those are primarily 300 volt, 80 degrees Celsius, 18 gauge options with the exceptions being the ones specifically for signaling. So that'd be like power good. As far as the cable lengths go, this is another place where the documentation was inconsistent with reality. All of our measurements came up shorter than advertised. The main ATX cable is 480 millimeters, meaning it's missing a full 20 millimeters off the target. The CPU cable is 490 millimeters, also a bit short. It's the closest one though to the advertised measurement. The PCIe cables were both 425 millimeters to the first connector and a common 150 millimeters to the second. All three of the storage and accessory cables were 4 
450, 160, and 160 millimeters to the first, second, and third connectors. So Thermal Take advertised longer lengths than reality, which is just frustrating for a user who might be choosing their case based on, or their power supply even, based on their case where that EPS 12 volt cable length has to be pretty precise. Wrapping up then, Thermal Take's 430 watt smart power supply is cheap at $30 and it's cheaper than you might spend on a family dinner or something like that. And with its five-year warranty, it probably has hopefully more staying power than that same dinner would have. Now, as for the statistics, the actual numbers we put it through looking at our charts, the Thermal Take Smart 430 Watt is the worst that we've tested any time in the past year. However, there are far worse power supplies out there, so it's not bad in the sense that we didn't have it catch on fire, so that's a plus, and it wouldn't be the first time we've had things catch on fire. It was still within most of the acceptable range of performance for what it is. It's not good, so just be really clear on that. Voltage ripple, for example, is very high. It's upwards of 90 millivolts, uh, depending on which metric you're looking at. And it's the highest on our charts, doubling some of the others that were $50 when we bought those power supplies. So it's not a good performer. But again, it's, it, we did not encounter anything that would be dangerous. Uh, in our testing that doesn't preclude it from happening. It could always happen, but we didn't see it in our testing. For short circuit protection, the negative 12 volt was lacking it, at least on our unit. So that is something that should have been corrected for efficiency, it was scraping by. So then, if budget is tight and you've spec'd out a very low-end computer and hearing the phrase, don't cheap out on a power supply doesn't help you because you just don't have the money to go more expensive with it, the $30 430-watt thermal take smart does seem like it's an okay option that would be acceptable for a really cheap computer. If you are doing something like a home office build or a low-end gaming PC, maybe with something like a GT1030 in it, an A380, something like that, this power supply is, it, it maxes out about there. i3, i5, r5, non-K SKU, stuff like that and a low-end GPU in the sub $200 class, and it, it does seem okay for that if you need to save some money. Not everyone can just go buy a $50 power supply, and that's what this market, uh, that's what this power supply fills in terms of the market demand. So we didn't see anything majorly wrong to say don't buy this, is what we're saying. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. You can support this type of work directly by going to store.gamersnexus.net and grabbing one of our large mod mats or medium mod mats. The large mod mats are arriving very soon. They have wiring diagrams. If on the topic of power supplies, you need to see how the pins are configured. They're also an anti-static work surface for working on your computer, protecting the table and the parts themselves. And they now have a seven-year retroactive warranty that we've applied to everybody who's ever purchased one. So if you want to support our efforts of continuing to expand that program, head over to store.gamersnexus.net and grab one. It also supports this testing. Or patreon.com slash gamersnexus, where we're publishing some new behind-the-scenes posts for written content and some videos. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.